what's the difference between ESG investing, sustainable investing, impact investing? Well, here to talk with us about it is Tony Davidow, author of Goals-Based Investing. Tony, welcome. Thanks for having me, Bob. It's a pleasure. Um, in your new book and in the blog that we're talking about today, you have, uh, um, uh, you have a discussion about these terms and what advisors need to know about them. Yeah, and I think as at a very basic level, it really needs to start by understanding what are we talking about? SRI, socially responsible investing, is very different than ESG, environmental, social, and governance screening. Uh, sustainability is kind of a big umbrella that, that captures all of these. Um, and I think for, for many, many years, there was a lot of confusion and a lot of advisors in particular, I think, thought about SRI, the first generation of screening and thought, well, gee, that's negative screening. And therefore, in order for me to invest in these strategies that do well, I'm going to pay a price. I'm going to, I'm going to have to take a haircut because I'm missing out on all these great opportunities. And in fact, that's not the case today. And, and that's why I think it's, it's really important to educate the advisors and the consumers about it because ESG is a relative screening measure, and it actually allows you to reflect your views, values, and passions in your portfolios. So where does one begin in terms of trying to understand the difference between ESG, sustainable impact uh, investing? Uh, besides reading my, my book and my blog, I, I think there's a, there's a lot of research out there. And, and again, I would, I would argue that the advisor is really at a critical role because they can really be the one to help individual investors kind of parse through all this noise out there. I do think it's important to start by understanding what is SRI versus ESG, the two most common forms. Again, SRI, negative screening, we exclude things that we don't want in our portfolio. That grew out of a lot of the apartheid and uh, screening out of negative SIN stocks in the early 90s. Uh, ESG is a relative screening measure where you provide scoring to how a company scores on measures related to the environment, social, and governance sort of issues. And, and I think if we can just start by beginning there and understanding the differences, we start to understand that the outcomes are quite different, the portfolios are different, and the results that we see over time are quite different. Hmm. So you mentioned uh, advisors play a role here. Do you want to talk more about that? Yeah, I think it's a critical role for advisors because, you know, it, it's no longer a niche sort of strategy, which is something I've heard from advisors for years. It's a niche strategy. My clients aren't interested in it. It's only for women and millennials. It's only for endowments and foundations. Well, the fact of the matter is, and, and you and I were talking about it earlier, based on the U.S. SIF data, it now represents about a third of all U.S. investing assets. So today we're looking at a market that is somewhere the magnitude is 17 trillion in assets under management. And they include uh, endowments and foundations and family offices and public funds, but individual investors of all ages and demographics. So it's, it's not just for women and millennials. So to me, I, I would argue that advisors need to take the lead in educating investors about what these strategies are, what's the difference between them, how can they in fact be used effectively in client portfolios. And I suspect that if advisors aren't taking the lead, clients may be compelled to find somebody else who will, because more and more, I think advisors are looking at this as part of their value proposition, as the great educator of this confusing world that you and I live in. Yeah. So one of the hurdles with respect to advisors is, um, I don't know how best to describe it, um, either a lack of knowledge or, uh, or some fear around becoming educated uh, around this topic, or am I mistaken in that regard? No, I, th I think you're right. It's interesting. There's, there's a number of studies. Um, New York Life, I think, did a terrific study. I think the CFA Institute has done research on it as well. And they actually posed the question to both investors and advisors. And they ask investors, do you want more information on this? And overwhelmingly, they say, yes. And then when they ask, well, who should give it to you? They say, overwhelmingly, it should be my financial advisor. That's the expert that I typically go to to learn about these sort of things. If you ask the same question to the advisor, the advisor will typically respond back. The numbers are staggering. Oh, my clients aren't interested in it, or I'm not interested in it. So again, a little bit of a disconnect there. And, and as you know, 
there are some advisors who have really kind of put the flag down and they're really taking the lead on educating investors about that. They're growing their business because they're having a different sort of dialogue with clients rather than just outperforming the market. It's how can I educate them to have better outcomes? How can I align their values and their purpose with their portfolios? And, and I think those discussions are very different than the typical quarterly review where you're, you're pitting yourself versus the market. Yeah. So obviously, folks, uh, advisors can read your book to become more educated about ESG. Uh, other resources that you might recommend that they turn to? Yeah, I, I would say leverage a lot of the asset managers. So one of the one of the new phenomena that we've seen over the last couple of years is this becoming more and more popular is I think a lot of the asset managers have understood that they need to lead with education. They, they need to talk to investors and advisors about ESG in a very different way, because not all ESG strategies are created equally. I, I think what we all need to understand is their relative screening measures. So we need to understand the E, the S, and the G pillar. What is the weighting? How do they individually screen securities? So I think asset managers are taking the lead in providing a lot of the education. I would definitely leverage that. For the advisor community, um, you know, you and I in our work with the Investment and Wealth Institute, the monitor has been writing about that. And as you know, well, we have a whole issue dedicated to it coming up next year. So I think more and more as we see the demand, we are trying to address it as an industry perspective. The asset managers are doing the same. So for advisors, I think there's a lot of information out there. I think for individual investors, there's not as much. And and maybe sometimes there's too much information where it gets confusing. So I think a lot of the value of the advisor is then filtering that information, bringing it down to individual investors and bite-sized pieces, and actually talking to them about their personal sort of views and preferences that they should be incorporating in their portfolios. Yeah. And it seems like this trend, Tony, um, I think back to the very first Earth Day, I think years ago. And uh, and I now, you know, fast forward to today where there's hardly a day that goes by where mention of COP26, uh, right, the yeah. Global Climate uh, Change Summit, uh, isn't on the front page of a newspaper or, or a website. So it seems like this notion of climate change and people's interest in, well, I shouldn't say just only environmental funds, but uh, but ESG in general and impact investing, sustainability investing is is here to stay. I, I think it absolutely is. And, and again, I'd argue that uh, it's no longer enough to say, well, it's really just a niche strategy. And therefore, you know, people really aren't interested in it. They're absolutely interested in it. And the way that we know they're interested is we see the flows coming into these strategies, whether they be mutual funds, separate accounts, or ETFs. What individual investors are saying is, I want to align my portfolios. I want to reflect my views in my investing. And again, I think there's there's a huge gap in educating um, both the advisor and the individual investor. But I but I do think this is here to stay. And I think it's something that will get and gain more and more prominence as time goes on. Not just the environmental issue, which I think often gets most of the attention, but over the last couple of years, we've spent a lot of time talking about social issues. So if you can identify good companies with sound environmental policies, companies that have really engaged employees who, who want to work there, who uh, fit well into the organization and they're diverse in their culture and their values and their views of the world, and you have governance that provides adequate checks and balances, well, that's a good company. It happens to be a strong ESG company, but it happens to be a company with, with sound practices and policies, which ultimately what we have found is those companies often are the best performing companies. So it's not one versus the other. It's something you incorporate into the way that you screen and evaluate companies, which ultimately I think leads to better companies over the long run. Yeah. So Tony, uh, the book is obviously titled Goals-Based Investing. Uh, tell our viewers how they can uh, purchase it. Absolutely. Um, I, I think there's a link to my site, uh, tdavidowconsulting.com. Uh, on there, there's a, there's a little bullet that you can hit on and you can uh, go directly to Amazon or uh, Barnes & Noble. People who are interested in buying bulk orders can go to Porchlight. Uh, thank you for spotlighting the book on your podcast series. I think it's been great to talk about some of these things that I think are kind of at the epicenter of everything that's happening in the industry here today. And I think the book is a tool to maybe memorialize some of that for both advisors and investors.